Senator McCormick, we Thank are you. dealing with Proposition 2 here, um, which uh, is referencing slavery in our Constitution. And we all carry our little constitutions with us everywhere. And for anybody who doesn't have one of these here, we have a stack of them over here. You're welcome to, to help yourself to one of our little and our constitutions. We give them out freely. So, who would you like to address us? Thank you. First of all, for the, for the record, uh, I'm, for the record, I'm Richard McCormick. I represent the Windsor County Senate District, and uh, I come simply as a as, a, as a, uh, a concerned colleague on this matter. But also, I have taught uh, Vermont history. Uh, in the state college system, and I have, have taught as well uh, state and, and local government and uh, national government in the state college system. We obviously deal with uh, constitutional issues as the fundamental underlying issues of everything we deal with. Um, I would ask, uh, I, I, I am opposed to the, uh, to the amendment. Uh, for one thing, I, I compare the language in, in the Vermont Constitution prohibiting slavery, uh, and the fact that it remains, even though it hasn't been law since the passage of the uh, 13th Amendment, it is, uh, it is meaningless as law, but it is an historical artifact. And that it remains in, in the Constitution, to me, as a, a Vermont person, I say the term Vermont for people with generations in the graveyard, but as one of the people of Vermont, this is a point of great pride. And having taught Vermont history, the fact that the 1777 Constitution prohibited slavery so early in, in history is a point of, of great pride. It's part of, of other aspects of the, of the 1777 Constitution that had universal male suffrage. Now, of course, male suffrage is not admirable. But the fact that if you were going to have male suffrage anyway, to have it be universal was a, a recognition that the hired man had as much dignity and right as the farmer. And it also was a step towards woman suffrage. It was the, one of the earlier steps of broadening the franchise. Similarly, the fact that the Vermont prohibition on slavery is badly flawed and that it allowed for slavery people under 21, uh, that it was a step in, towards a, a better future, which has been, and I think probably was put best by Martin Luther King, that the arc of history bends towards justice. And this is one of those little moments of the larger um, bend. The fact that it is not law means that though we keep it there really as, as an artifact. And I think it would be unfortunate to take it out. I compare this to taking down statues of, statues of Robert E. Lee in the South, or removing the Confederate flag from state house laws. This is 180 degrees the exact opposite of doing that. Because those are celebrations of the Confederacy, which was, by its own definition, a slaveocracy. If one reads the founding documents of the Confederacy and the secession statements of the, the Confederate states, they say that the purpose of the Confederacy, the purpose of secession, of secession was to protect the institution of slavery. You don't need liberal college professors to say that. They said it about themselves. Uh, so you are removing a celebration of slavery, a celebration of Jim Crow when you take down a statue, a statue of Robert E. Lee, or you take down the Confederate flag. Here, we would be removing a prohibition on slavery, a statement for freedom. But then there comes the question that it is flawed. Is that a reason to remove this admirable source of pride? Because it's flawed. Because I would put it to this committee and I'll put it to the, to the Senate that all of our great step forwards, steps forward are flawed. The Magna Carta is not a, a document of freedom. The Magna Carta is a document of protecting the special privileges of the wealthy landed aristocracy of England. But 
and put conditions on the, on the, on the service of the king. That the king got to be king by the permission of the, the, the lords, which meant, shows up centuries later in the Declaration of Independence, the principle that governments derive their just powers from the consent of the governed. And so it is a tremendous step forward for all of its flaws. The Declaration of Independence is flawed. And yet I don't see anyone suggesting that we change the wording. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men and women are created equal. It would be better if that is what he said. One wishes they had said that, but they didn't. One wishes that in the list of acts of tyranny of the King of England, that they had not included the prohibition on stealing any more land from the Indians. Even though the prohibition on stealing land from the Indian was one of the acts of tyranny justifying the revolution, one wishes the Declaration of Independence did not refer to the savage Indians. But it does. And there's a question for history of not favoring history that makes your country or your state look good, or not favoring history that makes it look bad, but just telling the truth. We wish the founders of Vermont had not allowed slavery for people under 21. But that's not what happened. And to go and to, to leave the prohibition on slavery and just take out that objectionable language is basically putting a smiley face on history and saying, well, here's, here's the artifact, and we're just going to clean it up a little bit. We're going to take out the part that we wish which wasn't there. So I think it would be unfortunate to, to, to delete the entire slavery record because the entire the slaves, the slavery reference in its entirety is something of which we as Vermonters should be extremely proud and which we should preserve as part of our history. To leave the good stuff and just conveniently delete the bad stuff, I think is intellectually dishonest. And it is it is writing uh, uh, it's, cre it's creating a, uh, something that's not true. So that's my opinion. I am dreading the fact that I'm going to be followed by a witness with far more expertise than I. But uh, nevertheless, that is uh, my position. And I hope I thank the committee for hearing me out. Thank you. Yes. Sorry. No, it's OK. Um, I realize, we all realize it's a point of great pride, even if flawed and maybe not fully informed pride. Because, you know, I, I think if everybody was asked in Vermont oh, whether this included that uh, flawed aspect, almost nobody does. I mean, nobody's, uh, almost nobody I've talked to is aware that we still allowed slavery under 21. Well, my question for you is, it remains as a historic artifact. I mean, it's always a piece of history. It is a fact that goes with us in forever. No, it remains and, as history. You know, yes, that's and, question for that. And for me, a constitution is a living document and should reflect living values, and, I mean, current values and current, uh, uh, well, current values and current law. So it. History, nothing will be taken away from our history if we don't include it. So I'm just, I'm curious. I mean, I, I guess it comes down to how you view the Constitution and what, how, how it is applied currently. Well, of course, the Constitution is a living document and a living document. And were this law, were this functional law, and not just an artifact, I would of course support. It. Uh, amending the, I, I have supported constitutional amendments in the past, not quite as as, as cheerily as most of my colleagues. I've been a, a conservative on constitutional amendments, but I have supported them in the past. But this is, is is a place of honor. This is this is an historical artifact that it doesn't just remain in the history books; it actually remains in the in the document. And uh, it, to to take the entire package and part out would be, uh, in my view, to, to remove it from that place. Do you, do you have proposed language that he doesn't want to do anything? Okay. Oh, right, right. We're oh, well, right. 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 So, okay. Yes, Senator. Exactly. My proposed language is the Constitution. Well, I mean, there are people. <laughs> yes. Right, right, right. Okay. Thank you. Right. I, I just want to add my thanks to my colleague. I was. Uh, one of the signers on when uh, the email went out asking who would be interested because it seemed like of course yeah. why would you not want to support that your logical argument 
escape me at the moment. So I just want to thank you for at least bringing another perspective. Thank you for that. Chris. So um, I'll argue against my own position on this. But do you think there's ever a case where the provision in the Constitution is so egregious in some way that you would say, uh, regardless of the fact that you might detract from the sort of historical continuity of the document, you would want to make the change? Absolutely. I would say that's analogous to removing a statue of Robert E. Lee or taking the Confederate flag down. Um, yes. But I think this is not, I think prohibiting slavery is, is, is not an egregious thing. And the fact that it was prohibited imperfectly, well, that's, that's our history. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I disagree, but it was great. And I apologize that I'm not going to stay this. Okay, we can talk, okay? We have other people's money to stay. Okay. <laughs> yes, go do harm. <laughs> the governor told us this morning when we came in. Go do harm. So, Professor T. Tucked. Good afternoon. Afternoon. My name is uh, Peter T. Chow. I'm a professor of law at Vermont Law School. My areas of interests and expertise are U.S. constitutional law and history and Vermont constitutional law and history. I have published articles <coughs> in both areas. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity to testify before Senate Government Operations Committee today on whether Article 1 of Chapter 1 of the Vermont Constitution should be amended to eliminate references to slavery. At the outset, I would like the Chair's permission, I have submitted written testimony, but I'd like the Chair's permission to depart from my written testimony and basically track it in my oral comments, but at the same time invite, as I go along, uh, interruptions, questions, uh, I like to try to be helpful when I come up here, but sometimes there are questions I have not anticipated, and I am best served if you press me with those questions, sometimes driving back toward the South Royal, and I say, oh, the way I blew that question. But it really helps me think through dimensions of a constitutional issue that I simply have not given sufficient consideration to before. I think that makes perfect sense, and because this is a very, we're taking this very seriously. We're taking the Constitution is very serious, so we want to get as much value out of you as we can. So, thank you. Okay. Now, first of all, let me say that I, I very much appreciate and share 99 percent of uh, Senator McCormick's comments. He might have added to the list of what ought to be left, what ought to be celebrated, what ought not to be celebrated, Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation, which in fact only emancipated a relatively right. limited group of slaves in this country, uh, leaving slavery extant and operational in many parts of the country. And yet every year we celebrate the Emancipation Proclamation because it is in Senator McCormick's words, it represents a, an important half step in the right direction. And we don't want to obliterate those half steps from our understanding of how we got to where we are today. The second preliminary comment is that I'm not opposed to amending the Vermont Constitution. I've done it before. <laughs> Ready to do it again. I've supported it before. And I am currently supporting, or at least supporting consideration, of a couple of amendments that are currently under consideration. I think the Vermont Constitution might be improved if they were added. I don't think of the Vermont Constitution, which has been amended more than 50 times, as kind of an old jalopy that is strapped together with duct tape. But, but it's like a seven-year-old Chevy that's been to the shop a few times. Uh, it's not a virgin document, and to try to be historical purist about it, I think, is being mistaken. There are things that need to be changed. 
in response to Senator Bray's question to Senator McCormick, I would say uh, Representative Siebert and I were the prime movers in recommending that the Vermont Constitution be amended to make it gender neutral. No. That we felt was extremely important, even though the historian part of me kind of cringes sometimes at what they did to the language of some of the provision. For example, the classic hardcore term Freeman, part of our tradition, has to go, okay? But in any event, that's my basic position toward amending the Constitution. Now, I said I shared 99% of Senator McCormick's the view he expressed, but the one point on which I want to disagree, and it's extremely important to me, is I want to challenge today the assumption that underlies Proposition 2 that Article 1 of Section 1, in fact, only prohibited adult slavery. That the framers of that article intended to acquiesce in or condone child <laughs> I have ransacked the history of Vermont and I cannot find a single piece of evidence to support that conclusion. So that's the fundamental radical question I want to raise with this committee today. <laughs> and I think we have to be just good detectives and ask, in fact, is that what the framers of Article 1 in Chapter 1 intended? Did they intend to prohibit only adult slavery and not slavery generally? My view, as you will see, is that their clear intent was to prohibit <coughs> slavery generally, and they did not in any way intend to condone the institution of child slavery at that time. That is the way Article 1 of Chapter 1 has always been understood until the present, until the consideration this year <coughs> of the possibility of amending it. Now, I don't know how much time you've got. I apologize. We, we, I'll tell you I how apologize. much time. We have until 3.45. Oh. Well, so I, 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 I apologize to, to, to Gail. I said, you know, the committee's not going to be grateful for the fact that they asked for a couple of bales of hay, and here I've delivered them a whole haloed. <laughs> but you heard, you heard Gail's response. Yeah. A haloed of, a wagon load of hay is welcome if you don't have any. <laughs> so. Okay, well we may run out of hay before the session's over, so. We also understand that professors are trained to speak and think in 45-minute segments, so we've okay. got a couple of them. Okay. <laughs> well, don't, don't find out how long their classes are. You'll be and I also apologize for the late delivery of my written testimony. I really okay. wanted to get it in earlier. I, I, we had a little incident over the weekend. My, my daughter's house in Middlesex burned to <gasps> the ground. Oh, oh no. no. Oh, you're Saturday kidding. morning, and don't worry, nobody was hurt or injured. Well, that's Sarah. Oh, no. my, Sarah? My daughter Woden was off in oh, Rome. Wow. Wow. with four of their six kids, and so it was her husband and their other two kids who were around, but nobody was injured, and the town of Middlesex has been absolutely extraordinary in providing incredible support. But in any event, that occupied me a little this weekend yeah. in ways that I hadn't anticipated, which is why I'm running a little bit late. In oh, the I'm so sorry to hear that. that really okay, so can we begin? And I say the first place to begin is just to try to understand the historical background of Article 1 as it appeared in the first Vermont Constitution. There are two phrases in Article 1. I put the whole thing there at the top of page 2. The first phrase begins that all persons are born equally free and independent and runs through and obtaining happiness and safety. Then there's a semicolon. Then there's a second part, which says, therefore, no person born in this country or brought from overseas ought to be holden by law to serve any person as a servant, slave, or apprentice after arriving at the age of 21. Now, where did that come from? Well, the first part was borrowed directly, word for word, off the shelf from the Pennsylvania Constitution, all the way up to the semicolon. Okay. Now, it's interesting because the Vermont Constitution supposedly is the first state constitution to ban slavery. Why didn't 
since the Pennsylvania Constitution of 1776 preceded it, why didn't people say Pennsylvania yeah. Constitution? Well, the answer was that the Pennsylvania Constitution did not make clear that slaves were considered persons within the meaning of that first part. All persons are born equally free and independent. So what the Vermont framers did, interestingly, is they added the second part. That's original with the Vermont Constitution. That's the part that deals with if you are serving as a servant, you can't be holden by law to continue to do so after you reach the age of maturity unless you agree to by your own consent. Okay, and that applies to indentured servants, to slaves, and to apprentices. Okay. Right. So they added that. But notice how that operates. The first word is therefore no person. Okay. And then it goes on to include within the meaning of person, slave, right? Right? Okay. Slaves who are employed as servants are persons within the meaning of Article 1 of Chapter 2 now. Now you take that and you bring it around and you say, what does all persons mean in the Vermont Constitution? Who are these all persons who are born equally free and independent? And you say in the Vermont Constitution that means that slaves, in fact, are considered all persons. They are all born equally free and independent and they're all entitled to the same respect and dignity the same freedom, the same equal treatment as all the rest of us. So an enormously significant constitutional development occurs when the Vermont framers added that second phrase. Does that, I hope I'm not. Yeah. No, not that's, that's, I'm not making this stuff up, this is true, okay? We believe you. So, you know, <laughs> okay. But in any event, so when, when the Vermont Supreme Court, and I'll come back to this case in just a moment, first addresses the question, what does the Vermont Constitution say about slavery? It's the case of Windsor versus Jacob, which was decided in 1802, roughly within that first quarter century after the Vermont Constitution was adopted. It had gone through a couple of minor iterations in the meantime, but it, okay. This is a contemporaneous view of what Article One of Chapter One means, and listen very carefully to what the court thinks it means. The court, in Windsor versus Jacob, this is the Vermont Supreme Court, concluded without any hesitation, without any complication, without worrying about child slavery versus adult, it concluded, this is on the top of page three, our state constitution is express. No inhabitant of the state can hold a slave. It, didn't say no inhabitant of the state can hold an adult slave, but they can hold child slaves. It said no inhabitant of the state can hold a slave. Now, as a constitutional scholar, this is extremely significant. It means that at least the Vermont Supreme Court believed that that is what Article 1 of Chapter 1 did. It prohibited slavery generally. It did not simply prohibit adult slavery. It did not condone child slavery. Yeah, yeah I, I would say that the way, if you have a question, just please ask. And let's have this more okay. conversational than, thank, thank you. you. Um, being so formal. So okay. in this construct, what then, how is, in the second phrase of the section, the first article, how is it that someone could be a slave if all persons are actually born free and independent in the preceding section? I mean, I don't know how you could actually sort of have the status of slave in a system that doesn't allow for such a status. I think that's an excellent question. And if, if you will allow me to put it just a little bit yeah. to on the back burner, we will come to okay. it. But, but that, isn't that really the important mm -hmm. question? Yes. How, why do they, if slaves, if slaves are in fact equally free and independent, if slaves can exist in the state, if no inhabitant can hold the slave, then why 
why do they include the word slave? Right. Or a French, which seems to which seems to imply that that maybe the framers at that point in time thought no matter what we say, maybe there are slaves in the state. And this is when we get to it is the problem that we encounter regularly, which is constitutions take principal positions. Reality is complex and complicates our lives. The reality often does not correspond perfectly with what the Constitution requires or commands. In fact, I think if you look at the history of slavery in the state, you will find that there were de facto slaves during this time. In the same way, there are probably de facto drug dealers <laughs> yeah. in the state, which is not, but that's different from saying the framers intended by Article 1 to condone slavery. They're just trying to, I call it a double safe. They're trying to make sure that when we talk about you can't continue to be holden by law as a servant after you reach the age of maturity unless you're bound by your own consent. I think they wanted to make doubly sure that that did not just include indentured servants, it did not just include apprentices, but slaves were entitled to the same equal treatment too with respect to that particular relationship. That's my but I but I've struggled with that, right. Senator Bray, I think it's an excellent question. We can come back to that in just a little bit. So the second thing I looked at is, well, what is the proposed amendment? Yeah. And proposal to Madam Chair, I like to call it proposition to, but I see it referred to in the bill as proposal to. Oh. Which is right. It, it is. Uh, it's prop two. We don't know. Prop two. Let's see which is it. Oh, our standard template is to use proposal. Okay. Okay. In any event, we can refer to it as proposal two or proposition two. It's the same thing. It would amend Article One of Chapter One by eliminating reference to slavery in that article. And specifically, what it calls for is striking the entire second part of Article One this great original creation of the framers by striking that from Article 1 and basically returning Article 1 of Chapter 1 to the form it took in the original Pennsylvania Constitution, right? Okay? So I can just yep. interrupt you here to say that all five of us, if you look at the, the proposal itself, all five of us signed on to it. All five of us are now well, I shouldn't say all five of us, but many of us have started rethinking the, the not the intent, but the words of the proposal. So. Okay, okay, now that's, and, and that's what this process is about, yes. right? You're right. not precluded from having signs. Right. Okay. The proposal just really puts it in line. Okay. okay. Yes, so, yeah. if I could just go yeah. back, and I hate to, yeah. no, 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 this is good. I feel like I'm delaying some, like there's a place yeah. where we're gonna get to and all yeah. of a sudden it's gonna okay. But to so Senator Bray's question, I read that first article a little differently, I guess. Up to the semicolon, I'm fine. And I see the therefore no person after that as more of an explanation or an expansion of the, the uh, definitions that have been used prior to that. So that you're saying all persons born, therefore what that means is, and, and it continues as, as a sort of a further. Like an interpretation? Yes. A modification. No, I think that that is also a perfectly legitimate way to read a constitutional provision. And you know the problems that the U.S. Supreme Court has in reading the Second Amendment, where you go along and sort of you got a right to bear arms because a well-regulated militia. And so on. how do you read those two together? Is one intended to limit the other, or, and so on? So I think that's a, so. Look, what I'm going to suggest is we go back and say. Well, maybe that's true, but how did contemporaries back at the period of this time read Article 1 of Section 1? Did they read that second part as a limitation on the meaning of who is covered, who is going, who is, should be treated as born equally free and independent, or, or did they read it the way that I'm suggesting, which is what they're trying to do is put the hook, saying persons equal slave, persons, therefore, 
include all slaves, and all slaves are entitled. So, but anyway, that's a good, that's a perfectly fair model. So look, so the next thing we do is we say, this is the approach that's being taken, and then I say, well, what's the purpose of the approach of taking this? Why eliminate the second part? And as I read Prop 2, it says, the reason is that Article 1 affected, and here's the line, only a partial prohibition of slavery. And you see that repeated again. Even though the 13th Amendment of the U.S. Constitution had long since banned slavery and involuntary servitude, the Vermont Constitution, quote, continues to contain only a partial prohibition on slavery. And you have to forgive me, but it wasn't instantly clear to me what partial prohibition meant. That's the only language I could find explaining why are you doing this stuff. And it, I think I'm, I feel comfortable in saying what that means, even though it runs counter to what I think has been the long-held understanding of the article. It means the sponsors believe that Article I banned only adult slavery and not child slavery. I think that's what it means. If I'm wrong about that, no, I think, but that's what partial prohibit. Okay. Yeah. Uh, okay. Well, which attributes to the framers of Article I of Chapter One the view that that they condoned child slavery. Right. They acquiesced in it, condoned it. They might not have liked it, but at least they acquiesced in the institution of child labor, which is a pretty heavy indictment to put on the framers if, in fact, that was not their view, if that's not the view they held. So my task as a historian is to go back to history to find out was it their view or was it not their view. And as I put it at the very last paragraph of section three on page four, but does it necessarily follow from the fact that when you're talking about employment relations as a servant, you are, after you reach the age of maturity, no longer holden by law, bound by law, unless you agree to by your own consent. Does it necessarily follow from that that the Vermont framers intended to prohibit only adult slavery and not slavery generally? That's the question I asked, okay? Does it indicate that the Vermont framers condone child slavery? Does it mean that Vermonters generally during this period so understood the meaning and import of Article 1? That's really the crucial question, okay? okay. So what did I do? I looked at four different things. I started off with Vermont Supreme Court interpretation, understanding of Article 1 of Chapter 1. As I indicated before, you can read that opinion backward and forward. I've attached it as Appendix 2, just two short pages. And you will not find the court at any point indicating, hinting at Article 1 makes an important distinction between adult slavery and child slavery. Top of page five, again, quoting from the opinion by Associate Justice Tyler, our state constitution is express, no inhabitant of the state can hold a slave. Not an adult slave, but can hold a slave. And then the court goes on to say, and though the bill of sale may be binding in some other state, yet when the master becomes an inhabitant of this state, his bill of sale ceases to operate here. There again, you don't say the bill of sale for adult slaves ceases to operate. The court went after it with a sledgehammer, right? Okay, the bill of sale ceases to operate here. I don't care whether you're talking. Now the court doesn't spend any time making any discussing prohibition of adult slavery, prohibition of child slavery, what there's, but what you find that's significant is the court didn't even seem to think that was a significant distinction when it's deciding the case, okay? I also, by the way, looked at the arguments of the lawyers for both the plaintiff and defendant, and they both agreed, interestingly, 
that slavery cannot exist in the state of Vermont, does not exist in the state of Vermont, constitutionally. Uh, uh, they disagreed over whether the Bill of Sale ought to be admissible, but they didn't disagree over whether slavery existed under the Vermont Constitution. What was the case itself? I mean, who brought the, who, why, why was there a case if they all, Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. No, 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 it's a great question. So Jacob, it turns out, was, was a justice on the Supreme Court of Vermont. He had oh, to, you're kidding. He had to excuse himself from this case because of a slight conflict of interest. So, so, yes. so basically what he does is he brings into the state a slave who was in his employee for a substantial period of time. Now the good people of Windsor go up and talk to the slave, and guess what? They enticed her to leave his employee by, according to the argument of God, by holding before her the enticement of liberty and equality. So she leaves poor Jacob alone. He's now got to cook his own boiled eggs in the morning, right? Okay. Not long after, because she's obviously not a young slave, she, is, she becomes old, she becomes infirm and penniless. So the town of Windsor sues Jacob and says, look, you brought her here, it's your problem, you pay for the cost that we've incurred or have to incur to keep her going, okay? So that's what the suit was about. So. So a little bit of intrigue, enough for a nice soap opera, right? <laughs> and then the town of Windsor get its money to help support her? Well, so the attorney for this town of Windsor tries to introduce the bill of sale, say, hey, look, Jacob bought this woman. She's a slave. That's against our Constitution. He ought to be paying for it. And the court says, bill of sale is not admissible in the courts of law in, in this, this state because no a slave is illegal. Right. But okay. it cannot be enforced. What does the court say? The bill of sale ceases to operate here. Right. So anyway, that's the. Oh, okay. Hmm. Thank you. Well, you know, there might have been a little you scratch my back and I'll scratch yours involved. I would hate to ever ascribe that to the Vermont Supreme Court. But obviously one of their brethren might have been liable for the cost of upkeep if the court had admitted the bill of sale, and the court in that case then refuses to do so, okay? So, so anyway, really interesting case, but it's the only case in which the Vermont Supreme Court addresses the whole question, and not a single word about does the Vermont Constitution prohibit only adult slavery but condone child slavery? Not a, that distinction simply doesn't yeah, appear no or operate, okay? Anywhere the argument of counsel in the opinions of the two justices. The Chief Justice, by the way, was named Chief Justice Robinson. It was not the same Chief ju the same Justice that's currently sitting. She may be of advanced years, but she's not that. <laughs> and she's not Chief. <laughs> okay. Um, does it help uh, does it, uh, that this, is, this ruling is only 25 years after the Constitution itself was written? I mean, that, you know, that you were you able to establish that they might have actually talked to framers, known those framers, have right. had conversations with the people who wrote the Constitution that they were eventually interpreting? Well, generally as a matter of constitutional interpretation, if there are phrases we don't understand or provisions we don't understand, we often ask, well, what was the contemporary understanding? Yeah and how far back you go with contemporaries, but I'm just saying you're talking within a 25 year period of the time the first Vermont Constitution was done. That at least is a reflection of contemporary understanding, which I think ought to inform then our understanding, if not of Article One, at least of what the framers of Article One, of what lawyers and judges understood Article One to do, and what the general public understood. Article and what they all understood, perfectly consistent across the they understood that Article One banned slavery in Vermont. Not at all slavery, not only at all, but banned slavery. Which is sort of what people feel today. I mean, when you ask people out on the street, that's what everyone assumes. That has been the consistent view from for the last 240 years in what? the state of Vermont. 
that. That's what, if you look at the, just the bracketed head notes to Article 1, yeah. you will find after the colon, a semicolon, slavery prohibited. Consistent understanding. So when I look at Proposition 2 and I say, well, why are they doing this? They say, well, Article 1, in fact, only prohibited adult slavery. I said, where's this coming from? And I can understand where it's coming from. We've talked about it. It comes from how you read the relationship between Part 2 and Part 1, um, Article 1 itself. So now I am embarked as a history detective looking for, was it turns out, the dog that doesn't bark. I say, OK, I got, a Supreme, I got one Supreme Court decision, and that's a pretty definitive statement. Okay. Right. But if Vermonters during this time thought that child slavery was perfectly legal, wouldn't there be at least some court decisions in which bills of sale for child slaves were introduced, and there was an argument about whether they were binding or not binding. But I have done the best job, and I may have missed something, but I have been unable to find a single case in which the bill of sale for a child slave was ever introduced in court, say nothing about enforced in court. Now, if child slavery was perfectly legal, then a bill of sale could have been introduced and it would have been enforced by the court. But I think it's kind of significant that you don't find any cases to that effect. I think that reflects the general view understood by everyone in Vermont that Article I banned slavery. And uh, it banned slavery, child slavery, in the same way that it banned adult slavery. If you can't introduce a bill of sale involving an adult slave, you can't introduce a bill of sale involving a child slave. I say it's the dog that doesn't bark because I couldn't find anything. <laughs> I wake, lie awake at night listening. <laughs> There's got to be a case out there. So, I'm almost prepared to say I'm putting five bucks on the table. If you find me a case in which the court allowed admission of a bill of sale for a child, for a child slave in Vermont, that five bucks is yours. <laughs> well, however, if you want to take up that bet, you've got to put your five bucks on the table. Senator, I apologize. I had a really rough snow day. This afternoon, I was stuck in my driveway. Yeah. Anyway, so you may have already talked about what I'm going to ask you about, but I, mean, I hear what you're saying, but that I just to keep coming back to why did they put those words in after arriving to the age of 21 years? I mean, were they just where? Why would they put those words there? Okay, now that's. I mean, we always just raised this whole thing to begin with, obviously. I have the same question, and I don't know if I've got the answer, but I'm going to answer that question the best. If the purpose was not to say only adult slavery is prohibited, child slavery is permitted, why did they bother even to use the word slave in the second part, right? right. If slaves don't exist in Vermont, you don't need it in the second part. OK, I'm going to come back to that if, with your permission, sure. Senator Trudeau. Take your time. So look, I looked at two other things. And, and these are not unimportant. There's a wonderful book by, I think, Professor Whitfield at UVM about slavery in Vermont during this period of time, and he really complicates our understanding. It ma makes it impossible to come away feeling that Vermont was some sort of idealized slave-free republic during this period of time. Because what he demonstrates is notwithstanding whatever the law right. said, notwithstanding the Constitution, people brought slaves into Vermont and kept them as servants. Okay. Paid or unpaid? Kept them as servants. Kept them as servants. But and, and the not. rule for indentured servants, interestingly, and slaves, the rule of the game were pretty much the same. You don't have to pay them compensation, but you have to provide the basics food, lodging, clothing, for as long as so they are bound by law to be in your service. Okay. Same rule for indentured servants. And yep. so were. They weren't brought up on charges. Those people, I mean, surely they would have been outed by their neighbors. Who? The people who brought the people into Vermont and then used them as slaves. What about if Ira Allen brought slaves into Vermont and kept them in Burlington? As he did, right? As he, as he did. Yeah. yeah. 
Hey, look, the Allens are not paragons of virtue. They certainly were not. There's, there's a provision in the Vermont Constitution, very important, you can't confiscate property for public use without paying compensation. You think Ethan cared very much about that when he was he going around in the South confiscating the Yorker's property? <laughs> right? Okay. So, it happens. Look. But you would have won. But, 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 but the fact that the practice does not conform right. to the right. constitutional right. requirements does not constitute, it seems to me, basis for concluding that the framers of the Vermont Constitution condoned slavery, child slavery, adult slavery, it just is to say life is more complicated than you would understand if you just looked at the constitutional text. People kept slaves as servants. You can look at uh, census records, and they're often referenced to household X, servant Y. We just don't know whether that servant was in fact right. an indentured servant, a slave, or a, a servant who was actually in the paid employee of the household. We just can't determine that. But I suspect that in, in not a few cases, those servants in fact were slaves. That's, I think, a fair, I think it was exceptional, but still, it happened. And we, it's important that that we recognize that. So, but what's the significance of that for our inquiry? And, and all I could say is, hey, I've looked at the instances we know where servants, in fact, were slaves. And there's no clear pattern that somehow most of them were child slaves. In fact, the primary examples we have, with maybe one or two exceptions, are examples where the servants were adult slaves. So the actual practice also, it's kind of a dark side, murky, actual, de facto practice. Doesn't reflect the view that Vermonters had that somehow having child slaves was okay, but adult slaves was not. I would say most of those cases probably do involve adult slaves, the de facto slaves, okay? Now, in part, this may begin to set the stage for responding to Senator Polina's Case because I think the framers during this period were probably aware that whatever they say, people, some people in the state were bringing slaves into the state, and and we have to figure out: should we include them in part two, or should we not include them in part two? What if we don't include them? What would that be? What if we include them? What would that mean? Okay. The last thing I looked at, you also find that you see, Whitfield found a copy, a recorded copy in a town archive of a bill of sale for a child slave. I can't remember what town it was, but it was an Vermont town, okay? And I say, well, does that mean then that the framers of Article I condoned child slavery? And my answer to that is, you know, if you want it, the way to answer that is to ask if, if bills of sale for child slavery were ever legally enforced. It's not whether they exist. All the time, every day in Vermont, people make contracts to do illegal things. I know this probably comes as a surprise. It's a shot. Yeah. Well, I could offer you $2,000 to supply me with a pound of high quality Canadian marijuana. You deliver the marijuana to me. We, we enter in it, we actually sign an agreement to that effect. You deliver, and then I say, I'm not paying you. Okay. Do you think if the supplier were to bring that contract into court, the court would enforce it? And the answer is no. There's a whole body of 19th and 20th century law where courts refuse to enforce contracts that are either involve illegal actions or involve actions that are clearly contrary to state policy. Some states enforce surrogate mother contracts. Other states refuse to do so. So if you've got a legally binding contract in one state and you try to get it enforced in the courts of a state that doesn't enforce it, it won't be enforced, okay? Uh, I could, I know you're not gonna like this example, but if I had a piece of property and I said, hey look, nice cabin out in the woods, I'll rent it to you for $50 a month, 
if you promise to pay me $50 on the first of every month and provide certain sexual favors on every other Tuesday night. Now, we may know of people that have engaged. Okay, okay. Could I walk into court and enforce that? So the simple point is that the mere fact that you discover a bill of sale, recorded, stamped, sealed, notarized, and delivered in some town records doesn't mean that the framers of the Vermont Constitution endorsed jobs like this. This happens to be a bill of sale for each. What happened in that case is really interesting. So the guy takes his bill of sale, which proves he owns the slave, and the slave goes up to Quebec and sells the slave up there. Couldn't move in Vermont because none of this stuff would be legally enforceable. But that's the way that story ends. So, so those are the four things that I looked at. One, what did the Vermont Supreme Court say? Two, is there any evidence in, in the courts of the state up until the Civil War of anybody going into court and enforcing a bill of sale for a child slave? No. The actual practice, illegal practice of holding slaves, there's no clear pattern that somehow child slaves were more prevalent than adult slaves. And finally, the mere existence of a bill of sale proves nothing. So I'm about finished, Senator Bray, so hang in there. <laughs> hey, look, I know I was like, <laughs> OK. In short, and I'm, I'm going to page eight. In short, there's no evidence that in adopting Article 1, the framers of the first Vermont Constitution intended to ban only adult slavery. There's no evidence that the framers intended to condone child slavery. There's no evidence indicated that they intended the prohibition of slavery expressed in Article 1 to be only a, quote, partial prohibition. In contrast, all the evidence that I was able to discover uniformly supports the view that in adopting Article 1, the framers intended to ban slavery generally in the state. That's the way Article 1 was understood by early Vermonters. That's the way it's been consistently understood and interpreted from the earliest days of the state's history down to the present. Which brings us to the difficult question, now why did they put the word slave in the second part? Why do you need to do that if, slave, if slaves don't exist, if you're already free, right? I have three, I've made a stab at, at trying to understand what might have motivated the framers to do so. The first possibility is the, Unlike the Pennsylvania Constitution, which you said that one paragraph, they wanted to somehow make clear that the word person included the word slave. And if you read the two, the first part and the second part together, that flows almost logically. And that's what the, how, why the Vermont Supreme Court decided as it did in the Windsor versus Jacob case. If you just had the first part, that's what the Pennsylvania Constitution had, and nobody thought that that Constitution, the first part, prohibited slavery. Vermont framers nailed that baby down by adding the second part. Whether they did so clumsily or effectively, we can debate. Okay, what's another possible explanation? Another possible explanation is that despite the constitutional prohibition of slavery across the board, the reality in practice was that sometimes slaves, in fact, had been brought into the state and were currently serving as servants. Now, the way I analogize it, and you may not find it helpful, is it's the relationship of a slave to a master is not unlike, in some respects, the kind of abusive relationship that people sometimes have with their husbands or their wives. And you can't just walk up and say, hey, look, you're free. Get out of there. Why? Well, you can, but oftentimes it isn't very effective. Why? Because people are locked into those relationships. And you can imagine the same way that a person who's been abused is locked into a relationship with an abusive partner. A slave, hey, here I am in Bellows Falls, Vermont. And my family's all in yeah. Mississippi. Yeah. yeah, so what am I going to do? Walk down to the diner and say I'm free and have a, have a, you know, malted milk? 
Uh, yeah, the practical but, application. But, but, I, but look what this does. Look what this does. It makes clear that if you happen to be one of those people who is still being treated as a slave, and you're a servant, when you reach the age of maturity, you have exactly the same rights as indentured servants do, and as apprentices to say, that's the end of it. Unless we work out some agreement that I agree to, you, I am no longer gonna stay in your employ. So, so it's a kind of signal out there to those de facto slaves that, that you've got the same rights. And that brings to the, me to the third, the third possible explanation, which is what would you do if you were the framers of Article I? Do you leave slave out of the second part? Do you leave that word out of it? Okay. So now it reads, and no person who serves as a servant can be beholden by law to continue to do so after reaching the age of majority, including indentured servants and apprentices. And so. Yeah. So the implication is then that maybe slaves are not Persons, right? This, I call that a double safe. It's like some people have a double lock on their, their door. They lock the floor lock. We don't, uh, we've never locked our doors once. I don't think we have a lock. But some people have double lock. It's like a double lock. You say, there's no such thing as slaves, but if there are slaves, this guarantees that when you reach the age of maturity, you can walk. You can negotiate your own relationship with your own. So those are the three, I know, Senator Kalina, I see you're raising your eyebrow, you're not terribly convinced, but I'm trying to understand why it's in there too, and it seems to me it's gotta be either one of those or a combination of those. They could have technically left the word slave out of the second part, but the consequence would be just the nagging question, are slaves entitled? People who are de facto, are they entitled to the same emancipation? when they reach the age of maturity, or are they not? They would have left that question. I suppose somebody does like what we do in the legislature, and they threw the word in, hey, this does the work we want to do. Professor, I think you've actually artfully answered the question, that parenthetical phrase, after arriving to the age of 21, if that phrase was removed originally by the framers, yes. it would in indicate to me, perhaps, that at that stage, in those times, in that era, the age majority was much more important for a lot of reasons than it may be today. We've tinkered with 18 being an age that, that certain things can happen for people. 21's an age that can be 26 apparently still the age that you can rent a vehicle. I'm not sure why it's 26, but so I think the brain is developed. Men's brains are fully developed at 25. That's amazing. Well, thank you all. I thought it was 47. No, no, that, that's good. No, that's good. So, so, so you didn't have that in there, however. Some of these indentured servant contracts carried you up till the age of 30. Yes, but they oh, were okay. individual contracts. Yeah. I mean, they were... They was were no legally reason. binding. You got, you got lodging, you got food, you couldn't marry, you couldn't decide to leave without permission of your master if you were an indentured servant. And, and uh, half the labor force in America right. were indentured, were indentured that's servants. There were a lot, a lot more in the South than there were in the North, but half the labor... <laughs> and how did this work? You know how indentured servants work, system worked? Because there was a labor shortage in this country, the ship owners yeah. would work out deals over in England or Europe, and they'd say, I will carry your son X, who's 16 years old, over to America. But what you've got to give me is some, like a transferable document that says, when I get to America, I can agree with somebody to allow your son to be used as an indentured servant for the next seven years if you pay me enough to recompense me for the cost of voyage and I, a little bit of profit on the side. So the ship owner's got this document, he arrives in Boston, somebody comes down for a month, we need a servant, you work out a day, how much do you want? 
okay? Yeah. And then you get an indentured servant for the next five to seven years. Okay, that's yeah. the way the, the, the employer paid the ship owner and then the, the indentured servant had to pay back the employer. And and this is how we got many of some, our yeah. immigrants. No, sometimes the indentured servant would, would independently work out a relationship. Yeah. It worked a lot of different ways, but employer, they often referred to the employer with indentured servants as the master. Interest, not the employer, but the master of an indentured servant, just the way you talk mm -hmm. about it. So, so there you have it. Now, I'm going to, if I could, Madam Chair, I would just conclude. I know I've abused my time. No, you haven't at all. We, we wanted to get you lots of time. why I think this is so important. When I come up to the legislature, I'll give you an example. For example, to testify in favor of legislation that legalized same-sex marriage in this state. I feel that in doing so, I can say to the legislature, you are carrying forward the great constitutional traditions of this state. And it's not the court doing it. You are carrying forward the tradition, the Constitution, because this is yet another step in a process by which Constitution shapes and grows over time. But I have the same sense when I do that, that in thinking that way, that all of us are standing on the shoulders of earlier generations of Vermonters who provided the pillars for those constitutional traditions. And I thought Senator McCormick was very effective in saying one of those major pillars that stands for liberty, stands for equality, is Article I of Chapter One, right? Okay. That's an incredibly important pillar. And so, so anyway, I feel that response, and I, and I feel much differently. He talked about the feeling of pride. I feel a sense of responsibility, but also pride in saying Vermont has a very special constitutional tradition. It has been at the forefront of protecting liberty and equality from the very first constitution. Article one is one manifestation of that. There are other provisions in the constitution that are other matters. But when we act, we are carrying forward and we build upon the achievements of earlier generations. Now, if this committee or if the Vermont legislature takes the view that Vermont framers only wanted to protect adult slavery, they condoned child slavery, I think that is a denigration of what, in fact, was their real constitutional achievement. I think it's a kind of defacement of the monument uh, in constitutional law that Article One stands for. It's not going to change what happened, as you said before, Senator Clarkson. It's not going to change the past. And it's probably not going to diminish what, in fact, they achieved. But I think we are not greater for it if we denigrate the achievements of the Vermont framers. I think we're lesser for it. So, just, you know, that doesn't work. <laughs> so we're lesser for it if we change it. Yeah. If we so change you're, it, so you're, no, 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 we're, we're, we're lesser for it if we if we change it on grounds that the Vermont framers condone right. child right. slavery because they did not condone child slavery, and if we attribute that to them, I, I, that I, is wrong. That I get that, but if we made more explicit our understanding seemingly for generations, that, that all persons uh, uh, are free. Yeah. Why not just say it and leave it at all persons are, are created free and equal? And, not, and, and why not just make it explicit and, and leave it made explicit for the, for the next seven generations? So well, I, I don't think the world would end if you just left it that way. I am just telling you, if you, if you do it, because we, you believe that the framers condone child slavery. That's that's what that is in the bill. That is in right. It is in the that is in the bill. And yes. if, if you do it, for, right. But if we changed stuff, our understanding of it, yeah. and still wanted to make it explicit and get get rid of language that may be confusing and is slightly archaic, yeah. um, what is the harm in making it simpler and more? Straightforward. I think you could do that. 
I, I, I might be inclined, I think I've suge suggested in an email to, mm -hmm. to Senate, the, the Madam Chair, that, hey, if you want to drop off the second part, what about just adding something to the effect that recognizes yes. the enormous achievement of the framers, say, the framers made <coughs> this provision prohibited slavery generally, and that's the way it's and always this was the even, even quoting from the Windsor versus Jacob case, yeah. the court has always understood this provision, just the first part, to prohibit slavery in the state of Vermont, making Vermont the right. first state ever, the first right. state constitution ever to, to ban slavery. So perhaps that would be a good solution. Well, you can fool with it. <laughs> if you, you just... If you just, um, I don't like leaving off the second clause. I, I um, Senator McCormick but, doesn't either. And he says, well, he doesn't he, want. He that. described it as an artifact. That, hey, look, kids are reading the It's always important for them to be right. able to see this and understand where we came from and what it was like and what kind of achievement was important. So, what, what if you the apparently the. Um, uh, the angst that's been produced out there is the um, the section about after arriving at the age of 21. I mean that it seems to me that and and I have to say that um, the sentiment out there has been drummed up in such a way that even the Vermont League of Cities and Towns, which is a relatively conservative organization, has supported changing the constitution. So what if you just left off arriving at the age of 21? So that you you left in there, therefore no person born in this country ought to serve any person as a servant, slave, or apprentice unless bound by the person's own consent or bound by, and left all of that except just took out those six or seven words. I, I mean, does that, does that um, negate what the, um, Framers. I don't uh, yeah, no, that's a good question. Let me think about that a little bit more as a possibility. You know why it was in there upon reaching it? That was considered a liberal progressive right. statement because it put a top end limit, which uh, if you didn't have it in there, you wouldn't put a top end right. limit on indentured servant contract. Okay. Oh, and if you're under 21, now can you sign a contract? Well, that's a good question. Isn't yes, that's a, another so is, it, is it implicit that the age of, I don't know what the age of consent is in Vermont, probably 18, but maybe it's... You could, you could be subject to a contract, though, and that the contract was not with you. It well, was with... Was sudden, how, if you're born free, how can you be subject to a contract? Mom signs it. Yes, because if it's signed in England by your parents, that... That progressed all the way to your owner or manager or employer in in Vermont. Yeah. Well, I, so, let me I mean, if you, you were subject to it, the first, first, first version of Article 1 provided that no male right. can be bound until reaching the age of 20, after reaching the age of 20, and no female can be bound after reaching the age of 18. 18. Yeah. which meant that female servants could go out and get married when they reached the age of 18 without having to get their master's permission, and they could go out and work if they wanted to. If they could find somebody over 21 to marry. <laughs> okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, I have two questions. Article 1 has never been amended. Well, yes, it has. Yes, it has. Because, because of the, oh, right, because of the language, the, the, the other language, right. Yeah, yeah. Okay. To equalize the age of females and males. Right, right. To equalize the age of females and, and to get it. Gender, the gender language, too, although that didn't apply so much here. So we have had a proposal that we change it to just the first sentence. Who's that from? I think it's ACLU. And including as the second sentence, slavery and involuntary servitude in all forms are prohibited. I I actually like leaving as much of the original language as is possible instead of, I mean. I See, I think the original language, although I now understand it, and I'm delighted uh, at, at, at the illuminating aspect of this afternoon's testimony, but I still think it is not clear to a modern public 
And that's who this is serving. It's not serving dead people. This is serving people who are alive now and who are, need to understand now what our laws are. I'm, you know, this will always live on as what was, but I would really love it if we could be simpler and less historically confusing. That would, that would do the same work that the 13th Amendment does. It would be okay. redundant of the 13th Amendment, but we just say our Vermont Constitution is like the 13th Amendment. Uh, yeah. Make sure we adopt the position of the 13th Amendment. Slavery and, and involuntary servitude are prohibited right. in the United States of America. They are prohibited under the Vermont Constitution. So you could do that. That would at least be better, I think, than just dropping yes, that entirely. And some people have ever asked that because they are proud of that yeah. tradition. So think about this, just dropping the after arriving at the age of 21 and leaving all the rest of the language, what that would do. What does it, what does it say then? It would say, therefore, no person born in this country or brought from overseas ought to be beholden by law to serve any person as a servant, slave, or apprentice unless bound by the person's own consent or bound by law for the payment of debts, damages, fines, costs, or the like. It would just take out the 21 after arriving at the age of 21. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I think that's possible. I, I don't know. I'm embarrassed to say what the age of consent is for entering into a legally binding contract in the state. I suspect it might be 18 years old. But I'm not sure. Uh, I think it. The age of. I did a whole study on the age of consent in this state about what it means, and it is all over the. All over the place, you can become an emancipated minor at 16. You can, if you are a whole process. I know it is. Yeah. If you're a child and you're an unruly or uh, I don't remember what the term is, the parent can't control you. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Um, no, it's not. It's way more than that. And they take you to the retreat because they feel you really need to be. Um, in an institution, I mean, we have little kids who are chewing up glass and swallowing yeah, yeah, it. No. I mean, it's so the age at which the child can refuse five. Wow. Yeah. Yes. A treatment. A child at age five, if mom brings him to the retreat and says, yeah. this kid needs to have some help and they need to be in a residential <coughs> program, at the age of five, the kid says no. Madam Chair, I, Madam yeah. Chair, those are, these are good, so, good, good, and helpful questions, and I, I just really would need an opportunity to reflect yeah. on the various alternatives to the proposal I was asked to respond to in yeah. my testimony today, and I've just explained to you why yeah. I think if you just throw out the second part, you are losing something, you're losing part yeah. of our history, but you're also losing the whole way in which. Yeah. Article 1 was supposed to operate in banning slavery across the board. And if you want to get rid of the second part, at least don't do it by attributing to the framers of you. Right. They never held. That is not fair. It is not right. Except that's, that's the way the public will interpret it, no matter what it is that we say. That is the way it will be interpreted. Because the way it's being promoted now is that that's, it was only a partial Prohibition, but it's our and job to message it correctly. Well, we can message it all we want, but that's going to be the public understanding. I told you, Madam Chair, I felt I was going to be swimming up upstream on this one, but I have done the best I can to share with you what I've been able to do. That's a great job, Peter. And I think everybody in this room thinks it's really important to be honest and true. Uh, yeah. about what we're doing rather than to base a constitutional amendment on something that we're falsely attributing. Right, it's fact. a false attribution, I think, that that has been incredibly helpful. But I will say that I believe that the sentiment out there right now is that we just got another letter that was just posted from the... Um, uh, Episcopal Church supporting the amendment. Yikes! They didn't ask, forgot to ask if they're a Episcopal member of this committee. Um, and, and I mean, we've gotten it from everybody. It, it, it is interesting that um, 
I don't know if you know Curtis Reed, who. Sure, I know oh, Curtis Reed. Okay. Yeah. Curtis Reed was in here and testified, and he thought it was extremely important not to just get rid of that second section, um, but to keep the reference to the prohibition of slavery. He felt it was very important. Yes, but he felt that for, I thought, a very odd reason. I mean, it's fine. Why he. For, to, because, because it helped further promote the uh, freedom trail. No, I he said that he said that it is for the black community that is trying to increase our uh, right, but pocket. it's also for the, the whole black tourism that he was talking about. <laughs> I thought. I think at you know? a uh, political level, it, it is hard to explain to people why those orders are there, even yeah. though you had an explanation, but. I'm just trying to think if you put this out for a public vote, you know, unless you can explain it, so he send you to talk to every individual to save the money. It's, I'm not saying we shouldn't do it. But it's just, it's not an easy message to put out. Well, we're not. We're if we do some. If we don't do anything, we don't put it out for a vote. Right. So it's just there. We don't put it out for a vote, and if we. We have to figure well, if out. If you don't put it out for a vote, we're going to have a lot of explaining to do. Yeah, then, right. If you don't put it out for a vote, that means the Fish Committee condones. Condones slavery. Child child slavery. slavery. Right. <laughs> well, we, we go, we're taking a vote on that. We're fine with child slavery. <laughs> so, so think some more about some possibilities of how, what kind of language would uphold the historic intent and the fact that the framers' intent, I believe, really was to prohibit slavery, and then to, um, and how we could do that in the best way. Because we're, I, I will tell you, I don't know about the rest of the committee, but I'm not wedded to any of this. The, the purpose or the language itself, that came from somebody else, and we just all signed on because we thought it was a good idea. I'd be happy to. Okay. my mind to it. It would be helpful to me, Madam Chair, if, if uh, you would forward to me the various proposals. Okay. Alternative proposals. They, they should be on our website. Been, they're on our website. There. Okay. This means I have. But I will. Um, I will. I will, I will send a link. No, it's on the committee. It's on the committee. Okay. I can look that up. Aren't they all there, Cam? Yeah. I'll send that link to you. Okay. So, so the, can I ask you one more question before you go? The other thing that's come up as from the main sponsor of this is that um, the, in the Constitution, this in our little one, it's found on page 28, the, um, it says qualifications of free men and free women. And her suggestion is- What article is this? It would be right before 42. Is it in chapter chapter two. Two. Forty two. So what did the Supreme Court do with that be? So it's been determined that the headings are actually part of the Constitution. Um, and so the suggestion is should we change that to to qualifications of voters? Why not? Okay, I just that, wanted that, to... that seems to me to be very, very simple. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, so sorry, it, it says voters qualified. No, it, it says qualifications of free men and oh, free at the way women. top. Got it. Yes. So that was a suggestion. I just wanted to hear it. Well, that's it. interesting. The way there was a lot of political resistance to eliminating the term freeman mm -hmm. uh, because it sort of invokes the yeoman, In the old, too. Yeah. <laughs> democratic. And the court, the Supreme Court, and trying to find ways around that really struggled at times. Yeah. Uh, they ought to have had King James come back and, and, and do that work. <laughs> <laughs> thank so, you so much. Well, thank you so, for the opportunity to talk. I really enjoy testifying, and I appreciate the questions. And I, I don't have, as you know, all the answers. I just have said, I will tell you what the answer is not. Right. Right. No, and I, that really was illuminating, and I'm very appreciative. Thank you. This was great. Thank you. So when we get some other some proposals, uh, proposals from people, we'll, we'll keep forwarding them to you, and then we'll have you come in and talk about 
your proposal, the teach out the, proposal. Okay. What the best option might be, yeah. Okay, send me all the mail we will. come in until we get a wagon load. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank, Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank, Thank, you. You. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. No, I, I, it's really great. I, for one, is a, is just, we are lucky. We are so lucky. This is the one place in the world, I think, where democracy really, I know you don't always feel that at seven o'clock at night when you're going, oh boy, that was a lousy day. But it is relative to the way the, the, way the legislative process works anywhere else in the country. True. Just exactly what you would want the democratic process to be with all its flaws. It is just, I, I just appreciate the opportunity to participate even from my distance. So. Thank you. Thank you. So I explained what the kind of the background for where this came from, and as if people didn't know, but <laughs> I did it anyway. And um, these are what I'm passing you out if anybody's interested. Just a section by section summary of the bill as passed the house. Oh, please. Oh, oh sorry. I was. was well, Yes. Yeah, so for the record, Betsy Ann Rask, Legislative Council. So Madam Chair, it sounds like we already explained the origin of this bill, the mm -hmm. Sunset Advisory Commission. And so the bill is introduced, uh, set forth the Sunset Advisory Commission's recommendations. Um, the House made a couple adjustments uh, before passing the bill out of the chamber. Um, so we first begin by amending, this bill would amend this section it requires the Secretary of State to maintain an inventory of the state boards and commissions because as part of the bill from the special session, um, the Secretary of State would be required to take the whole inventory of all the state's boards and commissions and uh, put it online in a searchable format. And it would provide um, information in regard to board members, their term length and expiration, and who appointed them. So part of the Sunset Advisory Commission process during the adjournment was to take testimony on uh, not only the boards and commissions, but how that inventory would look. And so some of the testimony from the Secretary of State's office was, we need a better definition of what we're talking about here when we're talking about state boards and commissions to make it more specific so the Secretary of State's office knows what they need to have in this inventory. And so section one of the bill would amend the definition of what we're talking about when we say state boards and commissions. The prior definition was based on the per diem statute for state boards and commissions, but this would make a clearer definition of the uh, uh, whole realm of what, what we're talking about, state boards and commissions. So they would be defined as a board or council or similar entity that is either created by state law created by federal law and contains state appointees or created by executive order. It's established as or is attached to an executive branch entity. It has statewide jurisdiction or it carries out a state function and it can't be composed of members appointed exclusively by regional, regional county or municipal entities. For example, it would include a thing like a regional planning commission is that just a regional entity? So that would be the realm of what we're talking about when we're saying the state, Secretary of State's office has to keep an inventory of these state boards and commissions. Um, one of the things that's noted yes. on this whole, excuse me. Sorry, but before you leave page two, mm -hmm. are you working from the age 16? Yeah. And this? As past house. Yeah, this is just a summary. Okay, so I'm just curious. Um, these aren't ors, so would you be kind it's of- an ant. Mm -hmm. It's an ant. It doesn't so, meet all of these criteria. Yeah, well, so how does the women's, the Vermont Commission on Women fit in? It's not, exec, it, it's not an executive branch entity. It, it, it does carry out a state function, so that would strike me as an or. It is created by state law. It is an executive branch entity. It has to fit somewhere in one of the three branches, and it's an executive branch entity. Oh, is? Yeah. I thought it was independent. Well, it has to fit somewhere in one of the three branches. Uh, it's enabling law. I might even specify that it's an executive branch entity, but 
it has to fit somewhere in state government, and it's certainly not the legislative branch, and it's certainly not the judicial branch. It's executing the law, it's enabling law, that means it's an executive branch entity. And it's carrying out a state function, and it's not composed of members appointed exclusively by regional, county, or municipal entities. So what, what about commissions that are created for serving the judicial branch or the legislative? It would not be included if it's, for example, the Judicial Conduct Board, yeah. which regulates uh, the disciplinary, provides disciplinary authority over judges. That would not be um, included in a state board or commission because that's an arm of the judicial branch. Okay. So any, this is basically just executive branch. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. I have not understood. And that's good because I mean, it shows how the former definition really didn't get to the detail of what we're talking about. So it really is just executive branch entity. So section two is in regard to the date by which the Secretary of State has to start maintaining its inventory of state boards and commissions. And the bill from last, the special session, said that that had to happen starting January 1st of this year. Ex oh, yeah. Well, the Sunset Advisory Commission, we haven't, they haven't come up with all of the state boards and commissions and all of the inventory data. And also, a big question that you're probably going to, or an issue that you're going to hear about from the Secretary of State's office is, what is this inventory supposed to look like? How detailed do you need it to be? And if it's going in the direction of where people think it might need to go, it's probably going to take a while to come up with an IT format or a platform that will handle it. It might cost some money. So in order to get all those details ironed out, the effective date of when the Secretary of State's office has to start maintaining its inventory is extended. It won't happen until, need to happen until January 1, 2023 which is also, um, by that time, the Sunset Advisory Commission is to have completed its work. So work fills the time available. I mean, really, we're gonna put off doing this for four years? I mean, three if, years. If I can explain from the commission's perspective, we did not have a definition. We did not have any idea what went into the inventory. We have to make those decisions first, and the Sunset Advisory Commission doesn't meet again until next summer. I mean, okay. it, it is got, it, got it. So mm -hmm. your time frame is sort of extended. Right. 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 So Section 3 amends the, what I'm going to call the standard per diem and expense reimbursement statute. It's 32 BSA 1010. You'll see it all over the statutes. It'll say members of the state board will are entitled to receive per diem compensation, reimbursement of expenses as provided in 32 BSA 1010. This is the statute that provides standard per diems reimbursement of actual necessary expenses for board members, that standard per diem amount is 50 bucks. What's going on here in amending this statute is uh, to use standard entitled to language that the General Assembly has been doing throughout the statutes that provide compensation. For example, it's just been recently that the salaries of state officers, um, the statutes that provide those salaries have been amended to read that the state officers are entitled to their salary, not that they shall receive it, just in case they don't want to accept the full amount. Similarly, that change is being made here to use entitled to language. I'm just cleaning up the statute a bit. Um, you can see it's a funny, it's, a, it's funny how it's crafted. Subsection A of the statute says, all right, this specific list of boards and commissions get 50 bucks. But then subsection B goes on to say, okay, and everybody else, that's a member of a board or commission that's entitled by the General Assembly to receive per diem compensation is entitled to receive 50 bucks. So anywhere you see in statute that a state board or commission is entitled to compensation and reimbursement, this 32 BSA 1010 provides that that per diem is 50 bucks. And that's important to remember as we go throughout this bill because you'll see in a few places where it's amending the enabling law for specific boards and commissions, it'll say board members are entitled to 30 bucks. Well, no, by 32 BSA 1010 because it's the uh, more recently enacted law. If they're entitled to receive per diem compensation, it's $50 unless the statute says it's more than $50. 
-hmm. So given my bill of a biennium ago, mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> yeah, there was no discussion of raising this rate, which has not been touched for decades. I believe the Sunset Advisory Commission is going to turn back to the issue of per diem at a future meeting. Yes. Good. It's about bloody time. It's unbelievably behind the times on this. So good. I'm thrilled you're going to do that. All right. Then the bill gets into amending the enabling law of specific boards and commissions. So here we are in section four um, in regard to the enabling law for the Travel Information Council. You, uh, it's just cleaning up this language, um, talking about adopting rules instead of making them, referring to the council just as the council instead of having to repeat travel information council in every location. And then on page seven, what's going on with the strikeout is first saying, using the more formal phrase that the members are appointed with the advice and consent of the Senate, that's just a formal term. And then you'll see that on page seven, the language that's being struck out is in regard to the initial appointments. And when, you, when statute says initial appointments, they're really talking about the very first appointments in order to stagger when the people are first appointed to a border commission. <laughs> so this travel information council has been around for a while. So it was an opportunity to clean up the statute to say, all right, yeah, there's six board members and they serve two-year staggered terms with three members appointed annually. That's supposed to reflect current practice. You'll we'll see on page seven that it looks like it's adding a per diem, but it's not. Um, Travel Information Council members already get a per diem, but the issue was that their per diem was set forth in uh, old session law, and so this is just putting it into the actual statute itself to provide that, that members of the council get the per diem um, at, and reimbursement of expenses as permitted under 32 VSA 1010, which is that $50 per diem. Another thing um, that's going on when, and what we're trying to do when drafting and what legislators are requesting in, uh, more recently is that to specify where those per diems come from. Who has to cover them? In this case, it was particularly important to specify who has to pay the per diems of the Travel Information Council because this council really straddles the jurisdiction of the agencies of transportation and also commerce and community development. And so the decision was made and proposed by the Sunset Advisory Commission to specifically state that the per diems are paid by the agency of transportation. This is partly due, you can see in the notes, due to AOT providing the administrative support to the council pursuant to statute. Also, AOT has a bigger budget than ACC. So who is currently paying? I don't know who in practice is currently paying. So sure. what kind of hit on the AOT budget is this and what did they say? I don't recall. In fact, I think they were supportive of it because it makes it clear. So pretty bad. Um, Section 5 is amending the statute for the Travel and Recreation Council, and it's just adding first in subsection A, just adding reference to designees after a few um, of the commissioners, two commissioner, oh, wait, secretary of ACCD and commissioner of tourism and marketing, because you can see or designee appears elsewhere, and it just was um, not provided for those other two. So that was just to make that consistent. And then on page nine, you'll see on subsection E, it's using that entitled to language and then specifying that the payments come from ACC. Then in section six, we move on to the so, I don't want to ask in each section, but in every case, did yes. the agencies or departments that are now tasked with paying for these yes. testify? Yes, in fact, they, they the agencies, anything that's dealt with in here by an, from an agency or a department, they were there testifying on the content, the changes, the eliminations, the... Okay, so in your committee or upstairs? In Sunset Advisory Commission. Okay, well, this is a bill that's just been passed out of the House, so I'm asking, oh. so did they testify in the House? Oh, I have oh. no idea about that. Uh, but, uh, let's see. But this is the bill that came to the House from the Sunset Advisory Commission. Mm -hmm. And I uh, recall that committees of jurisdiction were made aware of this bill, 
and yeah. the governor's yeah. office has been following the bill throughout the process. So one thing, um, if I may. Just uh, identify yourself. Kate DuBois, yes, governor's office, thank you. Um, I believe um, that stands correct. The committees of jurisdiction that were affected were made aware, and I think in a few instances, um, they requested that Representative Gannon, who was one of the co-sponsors of the bill, come and present the idea. And I think in um, almost every case, they said, okay, that makes sense. And the Committee of Jurisdiction signed off. There's a couple places where there were some changes made by the House that Betsy Ann notes in the summary document that we'll get to a little later on. But as I understand it, the standing committees did have the opportunity to weigh in, as far as I'm aware. Thanks. Section six is in regard to the Vermont Community Development Board. Um, the change here on page 10 is using that standard entitled to language and saying as permitted under 32 BSA 1010. Note here again on page 10 under subsection D that it currently in statute says members get a $30 per day, AKA per diem, but because 32 BSA 1010 was enacted, that applies and so they actually are getting the $50 per diem. So this is just cleanup language to make, to actually clarify the statute. On page 10, in section 7, there is a repeal of what it was called the State and Regional Economic Development and Planning Services Oversight Panel. Wow, what a long name. Um, it, this was created in Challenges for Change. It served a discrete purpose, but it was never explicitly repealed, so this makes it completely final that that council or oversight panel is repealed. Was that your first abolishment? No, well, it's one. the first one that appears in the bill, but I don't think it was the first one that we did. <laughs> must have felt good. On section, or excuse me, page 11, in section 8, this is a repeal of the development cabinet, um, which was made up of the governor's secretaries. It was deemed no longer necessary, in part because the governor can meet with them at any time where she chooses. So the decision was to repeal. Well, that takes care of a lot of the bill. Yeah. Uh, page 15, uh, in section 9, uh, this would re also repeal the Commission on International Trade and State Sovereignty, um, with the rationale being that it's deemed no longer necessary, it hasn't met recently, was the testimony, and that its purpose could be met in other ways. Sorry, that's page 16 it's of ours. on page 16 on ours. Yeah. Oh, it doesn't start on the bottom of page 15 in section 9. No, nope. section nine starts in the middle of page 16. Are you, oh, do you have the official version of the bill? No, nope. as introduced. You should be looking at the as passed house version. I know we didn't get that. Oh. We just have as introduced. Okay. Right. Well, I'll alert you where there's changes from okay. the bill as introduced. Okay. So if you do want to mark, the one change that you do want to mark then, um, just for your notes, is in section two, for that effective date for when the Secretary of State, oh. yeah, when the Secretary of State has to start um, so maintaining that inventory. It's 2020, but you, the other document says 2020. Correct. Yeah, I thought that was going to appear later on. Yeah, the House okay. changed that to yeah. give the Secretary of State's office more time. Yeah. And the big picture is the Sunset Advisory Commission's work would be completed by that time. And that's why I highlighted that in your section by section summary. Okay, I'll be able to note where there are other changes, no problem at all. Um, are we then? Film and media. Yes, okay, great, thank you. Um, repeal of the Film and New Media Advisory Board. Um, it's not been constituted since it was enacted in the law. It had, it's been at least through two different administrations um, that when since this was first created, it has never been constituted and therefore it's deemed unnecessary. So a repeal. Vermont Rehabilitation Corporation um, would also be repealed. Yes, it says family farm assistance, but testimony indicates it is not being used. Actually, if you look toward the end of this whole subchapter, there's even a section that provides what the funding will be in fiscal year 1986 that shows its age. So this has not been used, and it is uh, the proposal oh, to repeal and it. Actually, the first reference to a time is 1935. <laughs> All right, that takes us to section 12, and this is in regard to the stat State Natural Resources Conservation Council Board of Adjustment. The proposal is 
to repeal the Board of Adjustment because it's not being used. And so you'll see that this section amends this one subchapter. And what's going on here is that this Board of Adjustment essentially exists as an appellate level to address disagreements between natural resource district supervisors. We have these natural resource districts in the state. And this Board of Adjustment was supposed to address disagreements between the district supervisors and landowners who are not complying with district ordinances. And as the summary provides, under current law, when a landowner fails to enter into a stipulation with the Board of Adjustment, the supervisors can appeal to the Superior Court. Um, so because this Board of Adjustment is deemed as not necessary, what this uh, section would do is provide the district supervisors with the board, the authority the board currently has, which is an ability to authorize variances from district ordinances and to request that a landowner enter, enter into a stipulation that provides conditions that are agreed to between a landowner and supervisors. And then the supervisors would maintain their current authority to appeal to the Superior Court when a landowner refuses to sign a stipulation. So it's just a, pretty much eliminating the Board of Adjustment and transferring its current duties to the district supervisors. Just noted here in this section by section summary that you probably want to run this by the committees of jurisdiction, um, just to keep them in the loop, but there were no issues raised on the House side about this. Okay, then you'll probably see the full text. So noted, did you get that, Chris? Oh, yes, Committee of Jurisdiction. Yeah, Committee of Jurisdiction. <laughs> Roger. Okay. <laughs> You've been notified. <laughs> Notification check. Okay, so you'll see in your bill as introduced that Section 13 would repeal the Pesticide Advisory Council's annual report requirement regarding the state's progress in reaching pesticide targets because the report requirement was not being followed. Um, so that section, after further review in the House, was repealed, or excuse me, deleted, deleted from the bill. So the House proposes to make no change so that the Pesticide Advisory Council would still be required to submit this annual report requirement. But again, there was quite a bit of testimony on the House side about the Pesticide Advisory Council not submitting this report lately, the reports that it does have. Um, there seemed to be some confusion about this specific report and what it meant, so just to put that on your radar. But it's such actually. an important subject right now. Yeah, but the, we can the use of pesticides or not, so I would have thought they would have been here. We will take some testimony. Uh, similarly, Section 14 would um, address a report that the Vermont Milk Commission currently is required to provide to the House and Senate Committees on Ag annually. And the suggestion here is to allow the Commission to report as needed. So in its discretion, a discretionary may report as needed. Um, the rationale being reporting has been inconsistent. So again, it's just noted here that committees of jurisdiction should be made aware of this proposed change in reporting. All right, section 15 is in regard to the Sustainable Agriculture, Agriculture Council. Um, the, there would be a repeal of this council, and the repeal is set forth in subsection B of this section 60SA 4701. Um, but you'll see the subsection A, which sets forth the purpose of having sustainable agriculture, and subsection C, which is the Secretary of Ag's authority to apply for grants in accordance um, with the purpose of sustainable ag would be left intact so that the Ag Secretary can still apply for grants for the purpose of sustainable agriculture. But the council itself was deemed unnecessary, and then the proposal is therefore to repeal it. Oh, in Europe. What's that? It's the end of an era. This was a <laughs> sort of pioneering group uh, that uh, a lot of work on like organic and alternative agriculture and stuff. So, uh, so if it's done so much work recently, why is it? Well, been? I think it's been subsumed into other things. Yeah. So what has it been subsumed into? 
uh, programs like Farm to Plate uh, and Working Lands, the working yeah. lands and then the Agency yeah. of Agriculture does some stuff yeah. as well. UVM has a whole program. So yeah. I think it just got it. Was so the work is being done, yeah. but just in, under other umbrellas. Yeah, I think so. Uh, Section 16, you'll still see it appear in your bill. Um, the proposal, as introduced, would be to repeal the Transportation Alternatives Grant Committee because the recommendation was that functions could be performed by AOT. So throughout the section, um, in Section 16, the committee itself would be replaced by AOT, but the House decided to delete that section. So in your as passed House version, you would see deleted. I think. AOT might be taking House A, excuse me, House sorry, House Committee uh, on Transportation might be um, still considering whether to repeal this council, um, but for now it's out of this bill. Section 17 would repeal the whole chapter of the Vermont Transportation Authority because it's not being used with the rationale. Um, the authority is generally empowered to operate transportation facilities. Just noted in the summary that most of the chapter is not been amended since it was added in 1974. Um, it's also just noted that if at some point in the future, if this does get repealed and the legislature wants another transportation authority, it would just need to reenact a chapter like this or whatever changes were necessary. And then finally, uh, section 18 is in regard to the Capital Complex Commission. And big picture what's going on here is that the commission would increase by two members going from five to seven. And those two new members would be appointed one apiece by the House and the Senate. Um, you can see though that this section 18 would specifically provide in subdivision 2C that none of the appointees could be a legislator. So the two chambers could each appoint a member of the Capital Complex Commission, but nobody could be a, um, a actual legislator on the commission. Um, one thing to note was that under current law, it says that not more than two members of the commission shall be residents of the city of Montpelier. So you can imagine, because the city of Montpelier gets to appoint one member, so you would think that they're going to appoint someone from the city. And so that rationally, that left the governor with the ability to appoint one other person from Montpelier if he or she so chose. Um, now, because there are two legislative appointees proposed to be added, the question was, well, what do you do about um, people from Montpelier? How do you divvy up the Montpelier appointees? And so the House decided to say, instead of saying not more than two members of the commission shall be residents of Montpelier, just not fewer. So if you expect that the city council will appoint one, um, then you would just expect that either the governor or one of the two chambers would appoint another Montpelier resident. So it could take some coordination behind the scenes um, to ensure that at least two members are Montpelier city residents, but probably work that out, right? Well, I don't think the city council would point a not. <laughs> so that's one. Yeah. Um, so actually, I need to amend on the section by section summary because I forgot to revise that because uh, the House wanted to keep they Yeah, they want the piece of transportation. They want actually, so the Pesticide Advisory Council just got a reporting requirement, but the House deleted the section that would have repealed the Transportation Alternatives Grant Committee. So it's actually, under the House Pass version, it's eight, not nine. Sorry about that. I'll correct that for the record. Okay. For no, we didn't, we did, it doesn't repeal the pesticide board. It just repeal. it just tells them that they don't have to do an annual report because they're not doing it. And the information is still there. I mean, eggs right. would still ask for it. So we've still got it. Yeah. In your discussions, how many uh, this bill represents eight uh, ones that you uh, suggested repeal, be repealed. How many did you, uh, how many did the commission actually? Review? Yes. And specifically, we reviewed, we maintained one, two, three, four, uh, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 
Uh, 31, 32, 33, 34. Huh? Well, this is great. Well, I mean, but it's, 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 it's just, it's wonderful to see how it's like a lot of boards. Yeah, there are 265 of them. Yeah, so you did about a third of them this time? No, no, we did. So you looked at over. Well, some, so of, some, of, some of them we maintained because they're required by federal law. Right. Some of them we retained, maintained because they, um, like, if one, I think, listed in here were um, regional uh, planning commissions. We. Yeah, you weren't going to. We didn't. So. so you looked at it like almost 40 and you recommended eight. You never saw about it. Yeah. So yeah. almost 20%. That was what I was trying to get a sense of is you looked at how many, what was the universe, and how many are you. So almost 20% you suggested we retire. And there were a lot of them that we said we really don't have enough information on this or we need to review that or committees of jurisdiction need to do some weighing in on these. So, yeah. Any more questions for Betsy? Oh, I'm all set. Okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> thank you. I'll correct yeah, this doc and I'll resend it to Gail for posting to show that it's actually total board's proposed to be repealed is now eight under the as passed house version. Yeah. Oh, I have a meeting at 4.30, okay. I'm sorry. You, you're fine. Okay. You're fine. Okay. Okay. You're on your own. Um, so Tanya and yeah. oh, wow. Sean, you're going to both have a chair and have to give a laugh. Okay. Do you want to join us? Sure. You've not been in this committee before, I don't think. Um, perhaps for the facilities report, I didn't testify, but was in the room because I wrote the report the last two years. For the agency. Okay, I don't remember. I don't ever remember hearing a facilities report. Doesn't that go to institutions? It does, but we testify. We were in so many committees over the okay. last two years, so maybe if we. I don't think you actually said or like here. Okay. Okay. Went to institution. Okay. Well, 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 welcome. Yes, thank you. So. I understand you have a couple suggestions. I do. So, uh, for the record, my name is Dawn O'Toole. I am the Chief Operating Officer for the Agency of Human Services. And I am here to talk about BTERF, the Vermont Tobacco and Evaluation Review Board. I have five boards under, under me, including this one. And two years ago, we lost the funding for the Executive Director. So the Chair of the board did her best to keep things moving along, but it was very difficult for her uh, because there was no one to do the administrative work, and she resigned. And the board really has been in hiatus. It's really not functioning as a board. There's no one to keep it together or do the work. Um, our recommendation is to change the statute to call it an advisory council. It's very important work, and they do advise uh, Commissioner uh, Mark Levine, and it's really important work around tobacco cessation, but it just it's like it doesn't exist. It's almost silly because there's no one to keep it together. The Department of Health has offered to provide the administrative support they would need to keep it going as a council, um, and they would be able to continue to advise and recommend the commissioner. Um, they play a, a significant role in advising policy changes. Um, they approve the media campaigns. You know, there's a lot of work going on, as I'm sure you know, with youth and. Um, vaping. Um, so it's a way to preserve that work uh, and, and make sense of it with, right now it, it might as well just not exist. And what's it called again, Don? Uh, it, the acronym is VTERP. It's Vermont Tobacco and Evaluation Review Board. And in, there's a lot of uh, language that we'd have to strike out because it talks about doing an annual evaluation and an annual report and um, they wouldn't be able to continue that work, but really, it's not necessary. If you think back in time, there was so much tobacco money, and we were able to do a lot with it. We don't have that anymore. And so the, the work is much more focused on cessation activities and trying to stop this, what we consider a crisis with youth and smoking. Um, and so we would, there's no one, there's no money actually to pay for that evaluation anymore, and we don't really think it's a necessity. So we would want, we've made recommendations on 
changes in the language to reflect an advisory council role. Do you, so do you have the language that you can give, share with us? Yes, I don't. I just have the one copy with me here. Yeah, but you'll get you'll get it to us yes, so that we absolutely look at it. Yes. Okay. So you'd be a council under DOH, is that? Under the Department of Health. Yeah. Okay. They have a whole section that works on uh, tobacco cessation. So the administrative support would come through that particular group. Rhonda Williams leads that group. Okay. But they have the administrative staff that could help because you really, you need to warn, you know, post the minutes, set agendas. Um, and there's just no one has been around or available to do that work. They just tried to get together to approve a media campaign and they, they weren't successful. So it really just is either abolish them entirely or preserve the work by making a shift to an advisory council. And you want to preserve the work and shift and, and take on the burden of administering it and shift it to being an advisory board. We're more than willing. Right. Yeah. Seems like a good compromise. Okay. Any questions? Mm -hmm. okay. Thank you. So if you get that language to us, we'll consider that. And I certainly will. See if there's any more testimony yeah. that anybody wants to give us on that. Okay. I'm just curious, what are your other four boards that you oversee? Uh, parole Board, Vermont Developmental Disabilities Council. Um, I'm going to here. Um, Sir Vermont, which is uh, which one? AmeriCorps oh, and Vista. Okay. Right. Mm -hmm. And uh, Medicaid Advisory Board. Do you do that? No. Medicaid? No. She does. <laughs> Human Services Board. Human Services Board. <laughs> How did I forget that?
and they may have all different appointing authorities. And some of the criteria, which isn't currently in the recommend or the requirement for Title III and 116A, um, will have perhaps that someone has to be a um, Montpelier resident, for example, or someone has to have experience in tobacco, or someone has to have that, and we think that's probably going to be generated as part of that interest of the inventory. Um, so in terms of looking at the administrative needs on top of that, and then the platform there, we do, re we do have a strong recommendation for personnel. We have looked within the Secretary of State's office. Um, they have selected my division, <laughs> the Vermont State Archives and Records Administration, because we do publish and try to get out as much information that does come to us through, um, through current means, but this is a brand new requirement. Um, so it does not fit into our Office of Professional Regulation. It does not fit into our elections division. It doesn't fit into our corporations division. Um, and in order for me to incorporate it appropriately and resource it, um, it, it does require some personnel. Um, but it did outline it, it's doable. It's just a lot of work. And so the House postponed it. Mm -hmm. But to me, that's not actually what our need was. Our need was actually a resource to make sure. I was going to say, you need personnel and and IT and a lot of, have you put a figure on that? So we have, we, we put a figure on it that we reported to the commission. Um, you know, if it's extended, we might be able to do that. But we did collect information from Minnesota. And Minnesota had um, a number of development op. They, they actually have been staff um, IT, and they also have um, personnel that had been doing this. Um, their statutory mandates go back to the 70s for this particular function, so they had already evolved over time. Um, they entered into a new platform that they developed internally, which is something that we already have little parts of it through the Vermont State Archives and Records Administration, but not the level that this inventory required. So the recommendation came for two FTEs um, to support it. Um, if it's extended, we may be able to do one FTE, but we definitely would need an administrator component um, or allow us to figure out different resources in that, but it would be very difficult to do with no resources. And you need IT resources too, right? Right. Well, we have a web developer internally. What we don't, so you don't have think is you a need programmer. Um, it did come into the house as a recommendation to use ADS and their different services, but that is a charge to us. So either way, it is a charge to the Secretary of State's office. Um, as we kind of evolve in different platforms, one of the things that's one of the reasons why we invested in the web developer recently is that we have been using external third-party sources, but that that incurs every single charge. Um, this one we feel like we can leverage uh, much more agile uh, functions for that by having a resource internally, particularly around some of the commission's um, discussion. For example, one commissioner had asked, would you be able to add minutes? So is this a platform that eventually could be provide more resources in terms of boards and commissions and how a place where their minutes would be? That is possible. Um, that wouldn't be something that would be an additional resource if we're well resourced to administer this process. It is very much a registration. Um, Minnesota is all the entities um, have to register with the Secretary of State's office as a body. Um, the, our current law does not require that, but we did identify that somebody is going to have to be responsible for as the General Assembly works through its work each session, knowing what boards and commissions have been created, what kind of seats have been created, what is the criteria around that seat, um, and, uh, and then moving forward through that. Is there space in the office for this? No FTE? Yes, we do. We have, we've been, um, we've been undergoing construction for seems like my whole tenure with the Secretary of State's office. We're located in Middlesex. And so one of our recent um, construction projects that started a couple of years ago was to swap space with Print and Pulse, which is also in the same facility. So we have opened up, um, we have currently three vacant office spaces within the facility and flexibility for a joint office. Um, some of our positions, too, um, with um, Don O'Toole, who was previously here, we work collaboratively on the records management front, so we actually allocate a position into her staff. Um, so we have some rotation of staff occurring um, as well through a partnership that we do for the records management program. But we currently have three office spaces. Well, I have to say that Tanya was very helpful um, over the summer in helping us because we didn't have any definition of what boards and what, what we were talking about. We, <laughs> no, no. I mean, we I just don't mean to laugh at that, but it, 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 it just said boards it and commissions. It's not complicated to you actually look at it. And we uh, looked at definitions of boards and commissions and uh, <laughs> everything else, and she was very helpful in 
helping us kind of focus that and start to focus on what would need to be collected and reported and who was going to do that. So, thank you. Well, bravo. And parts of it we do have as part of the Vermont State Archives and Records Administration that's not currently in the statute, for example, because we do have the state archives. We collect a lot of information about agencies and departments and boards and commissions in terms of what their charge is, what's their enabling statute, when do they dissolve, because we have records that need to be associated with them so that people can search and research them. But that's only one part. So it had, if, it, if the charge had been originally just boards and commissions, it might have been doable, but the appointee part, um, you know, is a, is a whole different ball of wax, so to speak. Um, but in looking at Minnesota, their original legislation was based on transparency. How do individuals know that right. um, these even exist? That, that, that they can apply. Not exist, but there's, no, there's an opportunity to be participate. Yes, there's an opportunity to serve. Um, so we do think that if there was something that, given the opportunity with the resources, that we may see administrative costs or at least the ability to for agencies and departments that are providing some form of support or doing it on its own, including our Office of Professional Regulation and trying to post or trying to make these available. We would, all the information that we have to collect and compile would essentially create also the mechanisms to show when there's positions available. Right. It's the same, uh, it's the same process involved, um, which is the benefit of that particular, um, you know, mindset of going in and having it so that we could actually provide a lot more than what the current statute uh, requests, um, because we would still have to collect and do the same information. And uh, yeah. I was saying you got to hand it to the Minnesotans. Yeah. In many ways. I'm from Minnesota. Are you? Yes. She is our biggest cheerleader in this building. <laughs> in fact, she leads the Minnesota caucus. I will be in caucus. St. Paul in yeah. July. It's a beautiful state. Where did you go? I'm going to be did in St. Paul. Oh. Yeah. I'm going to conferences. I've been there several times. So. I've been up to where all the lakes are. Yeah, the, yeah, the, lakes. the lakes are all over the state. Yeah. There are 10,000 named lakes. I've been up at Brady Lakes, up in the northern boundary waters. In the waters. boundary yeah. waters? Yeah, that's beautiful. beautiful. Yeah. yeah, I was on the boundary, but bah, to the west of that, no water there. <laughs> well, thank you. You know, I, I congratulations to the all of you guys on this. You're on it too, right? Yes. Good one. And Hayden worked with us. Yeah, I know all Hayden. Along. I'm acknowledging Hayden with my eyes. It was it was a it was a good yeah. It was, it was a good group. Yeah. So Susan, how many of you? Susan Eller was very, yeah. very helpful. Mm -hmm. So the three uh, House members were Gannon, uh, Leclerc, and yeah, oh, it's just two, 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 two House, two Senate, and um, two Governor appointees, and that was Susan Eller and Matt Kraus. Yeah. So they just got you. What's that? They just got you by virtue of your interest in this. Uh, yeah, I was just there to help out the best I could. He was, the governor said, go forth. Pretty much. Yeah. <laughs> so just in closing our recommendation, um, I did put at the end of what I handed out was, um, was personnel, you, but we also we feel have that, that you have this for 2023 deadline, I know that the house had thought maybe by extending it, we may be able to Fine personnel, and my experience is that that's not actually has happened. Uh, but we feel we could do it much sooner. It just, yeah. And it's uh, to start that process with boards and commissions um, if we have the resources. Do you, are you going to have that in your budget this year? That one position? Um, I don't believe that they put that into the budget. Because you might tell them sure. that they should. Okay. Just because, I mean, there's no, if, if we want to get started and that that position wouldn't start so next to lot. Yeah. Right. So the existing boards part of the process of understanding and getting it kind of set up, you right. that resource was used initially for the platform and the secondary part was the administration part. Um, Minnesota reported that although they transitioned to a much more robust system, it does require about a seventy five percent FTE, even though they've had this long history. Um, so so we're figuring if there's this brand new yeah. function for government. So the recommendation from the committee would be to ask for us to put it into the budget. Uh, it's, yeah, it, it won't makes happen. sense. If you're, I mean, we have to should include it in our bill, shouldn't we? 
Well, if we include it in our bill, it will have to go to appropriations. If they put it in their budget, it will still go to appropriations. No, but then their budget goes to appropriation. Our bill doesn't. Right. Because the budget's going to go there anyway. Yeah. I mean, I don't think we want to put But any your budget's done, isn't it? Well, they, they testified last week. Yeah. I mean, it, it, well, they can... Amendment. Ask for an amendment. Wait, is there a reason with us not wanting this to go to approach? I don't care. I just don't. Because I think it, it may be helpful. It's a little late to be adding to the governor's budget is all. I mean, to the state's right, budget. Right, because the law was not passed until the summer. And right. so the preparation that we had yeah. for it was based on wanting to see how the bill is. But not so in terms of what we work with my and management. Let me talk to Jane and see what makes the most sense. Because I... And then if we can get the if we can get this out of here and done, yeah, that would be great. So, and it, it, am I just missing the actual ask? Is it a hundred for this really year and two, another hundred the next year? What what's the actual? We, we, we our recommendation to the commission, which I did not include in here, was two FTEs continuously. Right, but what's the dollar amount? Oh, uh, the dollar amount we had. Um, Front of me, unfortunately, but I can provide that to the committee. I probably have it in the I had done the attachment for that. This would be an admin services coordinator position that we would be looking at, which runs between around forty to fifty thousand dollars, and then a developer that can be around the same, depending on what, what position was chosen for state government. So it would still be two even though the date out? Well, the date is, is not really the, the issue as much as the resources that are not currently within the office to sustain and support it. <coughs> so about, if, if you're probably looking at 100 to 150. Oh, well, if you're looking at 40 and 40, that's the that's and you're looking the salary at thing. You're looking at 40 too. Yeah. percent. Would you like me to provide that? Yeah, yeah. that'd be great. I can't believe you get anybody to do this work for $40,000, but that's okay. <laughs> I mean, we'll look at the work we do for $13,000. Do you get a pay raise? <laughs> I, I got the same thing you got, which was, I think, closer to 11. But anyway, yeah, the number of the development hours that are combined was over 2,500 or about that by Minnesota just to kind of yeah, move okay. itself to a new park. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you for your help this summer.